Right, good evening. Uh, we're back for another study tonight uh, with Will Myhan and Travis Creasy. And always glad to have Travis uh, here with us. And we're recording our Bible class for tonight at Highland Park. Uh, also for Riverside uh, over in Fayetteville, Tennessee with Travis. And so we're just kind of doing this together. We've been looking at some parables. Uh, unfortunately, Blake wasn't able to be with us tonight. I hope that uh, he will be able to be back with us soon. Um, but uh, the three of us are going to break down one of the parables that we find in Matthew chapter 20. So if you want to be turning your Bibles there, uh, you can join in with us and read along. Uh, of course, um, I'd be more than happy for you guys to uh, start a discussion about this uh, when we post it on Facebook or whatever. Uh, always glad to see other people's thoughts uh, as, as far as the scriptures are concerned. So we're going to be looking at the, the laborers in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20. A uh, very interesting passage here, as are all of Jesus' parables. A lot of great things to be learned from them. And so uh, we're going to turn it over at the very beginning to uh, Will and let him read the passage for us. We'll be reading from verses 1, I believe, down to about verse 16. Mm -hmm. And so we'll let him read it, and then we'll just start in our discussion. All right, Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into the vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard, and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him, you also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first were... So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a, a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give the last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first last. Yeah, so there's some really uh, interesting stuff here. And I think uh, as I was reading this earlier today, I, and I don't know what all Travis is wanting to get into, but uh, I think it's important for us to back up a little bit uh, into chapter 19. Um, because if you go back into chapter 19, there's been this discussion, obviously the rich young ruler has been there and we know that story and uh, Jesus starts this discussion with his disciples. And in verse 27, Peter said to them, uh, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And you'd think right there, they're like, man, we're going to have all this great stuff. You know, we're going to be sort of in charge. And then he says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and those who are last first for the kingdom of God is like a vineyard. And then he tells the story and he ends it with, the, like the opposite way of phrasing that, the last will be first and the first will be last. And so, you know, Jesus is getting into this discussion because the even his disciples are trying to kind of figure out where do we fit in here. And we know there's other times where they argue who's first, who's going to be sitting at the head of the table, uh, who's the most important in the kingdom. And we all fall prey to that sometimes. Like, you know, am I better uh, because I've been around for longer and uh, because I've done more work or whatever, and we all can fall prey to that sometimes. So, Travis, what, what are your thoughts on this before we take that any further? Well, sort of like you do, anytime I approach a text, I want to read the chapter before or the chapter after it and kind of read it succinctly if I can't read the entire book, which I um, wasn't able to do this time, but, you know, to, to look at those chapters. And I think it's interesting 
you know, that this is kind of Matthew is kind of Jesus referendum on the law. It's written to the Jews. And so there's a lot of this, as we've seen in these parables, that there's this idea that those who come to the Lord first bear a responsibility, kind of like what you're talking about. You know, we do get tremendous reward. We do get tremendous blessing, but we also bear the brunt of responsibility. You know, uh, Abraham's told that through him, the whole world would be blessed. Well, that's great, and that's an awesome thing, but how much of the burden has been on the Jewish nation? I mean, there's been, they've been through persecution. They've dealt with different things. In fact, they're being oppressed when this is being said to them is maybe next time we'll look at the other vineyard parable where it looks at some of that oppression. And so, but I find it interesting in verse eight, uh, and when the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last up to the first. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 through 15, there's a command there in the law to make sure that when you hire somebody that you pay them at the end of the day, you, you don't delay because they may be depending on that money. And so th there even is that law entwined there. And then earlier in chapter 24, it talks about divorce and marriage of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. In chapter 19, what does Jesus talk about? Teaching about divorce. And so it's kind of an interesting idea that he's taking and putting these bits and pieces of even the parables that we've seen, bits and pieces of the law. He's going, what does that look like here in the first century? What does that look like for Christians as well? And so, you know, I teach teenagers and how many times have I heard in my life, that's not fair, right? Mm -hmm. From kickball to heavier, weightier things in life, that's not fair. And so, you know, I go back, I think on Sunday, you talked about the Sons of Thunder you know, well, they didn't listen to us, so we should bring down the fire on them. And what they don't understand is, is that prior to Jesus' death, if God brings his wrath on the world, which one day, you know, he's going to come back and he will call us all into judgment. But if he does that prior to Jesus dying on the cross, who will be saved? Who would be saved from the wrath of God? Uh, you know, Romans 7, Paul says, not me. You know, I can't do it outside of Jesus, you know, but we get that verse 1. Romans 8 reference, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Whether you come to him, you know, at 12, like I did growing up in the church, or you come to him, you know, at the end of your life, the reward is the same as far as getting to go to heaven. And, you know, I'm kind of of the mind that, you know, I want everybody to go. I don't really care who gets to go as long as Travis Creasy is in that party. You know, I, I'll, I'll take that. So, well, and I think, you know, most people who are familiar with, um, you know, Bible study have been, been studying for a long time may know this, but I think it's worth, you know, saying that their day, their work day started at 6 a.m. And so yeah. when he starts talking about the third hour, he's talking about, you know, there's some started at 6 a.m., worked all day until 6 p.m. Some started at, th at 9 a.m., some started at noon, some started at 3. And then the last group he got, he got them at 5 o'clock. I mean, they, they worked an hour. And then it says he called the last of them and started it. And like you said, uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 24, also Leviticus chapter 19 says, the, uh, verse 13, wages of a laborer shall not remain with you until morning. So, you know, this idea it better not still be in your pockets, give them their pay. Well, when they go to get that pay, the easy fix would have been pay the guys first who showed up at 6 a.m. You know, if he pays those guys, they all leave, and they don't know what he pays the rest of them. Um, but, of course, we wouldn't have the great point that he's making. And the, the point, uh, you know, that, that he's trying to drive home is, and we don't deserve this anyway. You know, I mean, he, we worked, we worked in the, the, the vineyard, but we only did what he asked us to do. The guys who came at 6 a.m., they agreed that they would work for Daenerys. The guys who came, which is a day's wage. Uh, the guys who came at five were told, hey, come work for me and I'll pay you. Um, and so he says, I didn't do anything that you hadn't already agreed on. I, I asked you to come work a day and I would pay you for that. What have I done wrong in it? So what do you think is the point? I mean, obviously we understand all of those uh, historical parts to it, but what do you think the point is for us or the application is for us as the church today? And Will, you may want to throw some stuff in here. Yeah, something that's interesting to me, and, you know, I don't, of course, I'm not near the intellect that 
the uh, you and Travis are. You know, but, but it's trouble, buddy. You're in trouble. But I, you know, I look at this idea and what sticks out is, okay, you've got these people that started working at 6 a.m. Yeah. And they work to 6 p.m. And they almost have this mindset that my 12 hours are such a significant thing. Yeah. You know, and, and when I look at, you know, and I guess my life as a Christian, yes, I, I do my best to try and live for what Jesus has called me to live. But I also understand it's really not that significant in the big scheme of things as well to the point. Yes. It's significant that we do the work of Jesus, but not that it's, you know, greater than what everybody else is doing. And, and I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of people that I've been around that I could be working for 12 hours and they could accomplish what I did in 12 hours. They could do it in one hour. Yeah. You know? And so I, I kind of look at this and I go, do I really as a Christian look and go, okay, I was baptized at 18 and now I'm 30 and go, man, my 12 years, they're greater than everybody else's that's only been doing it for four years. And when I look at that, I go, man, it's just so close minded to, to imagine that people can't do more in a less amount of time than, than where I'm at. And so I just, it kind of just astounds me that they go, man, my 12 hours are so much more significant than this person's three hours you know, or even an hour, because it kind of limits those people, you know, on what, on what they're accomplishing. So, you know, I kind of look at it from that sense of don't quit, you, quit thinking so highly of yourself, you know, and what you're you accomplishing. Jesus, I mean, Jesus lived 33 years. I'm 39. Nowhere near am I going to accomplish what he did. And, and I think that goes back to what your question was, Ben. You look at chapter 20, the, the rest of it, he talks about his death. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? The guy who dies. Yeah, who's going to be in heaven? The greatest sits at the right hand of God, and, and he dies. You can't treat a dog the way they killed Jesus, you know. And then you see a mother's request. Well, say that my sons are on the left and right, and, and we have the beautiful hindsight that you don't want to be on the left, right? And a few chapters left is not where you want to be. And he says, you don't know what you're asking, you know. And, and to be the greatest in the kingdom, I don't think that they get it, I think, you know, go back to Will, I don't think that we get that sometimes. I, you know, we want to be out front, but is that the greatest? You know, what is the greatest thing that we can do? Well, that's the amazing part is that they ask that question just a couple of verses later. Now, it may have happened down the road a little bit, but it's just like, didn't we already discuss this? The first will be last, last will be first. And I I wanted to bring in the thought (laughs) Luke 17. Um, Luke 17 verse 7 uh, verses through verse 10 has kind of been one of those things that just sort of hits you in the mouth a little bit. Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded of him? So also you, when you have done all that you have been commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Now think about that from, you know, Christian Christianity perspective of how many times do we sometimes go, well, look at all the things I've done. Look at how many times I've worked. Look at how many hours I've worked. Look at all the things that I've gone to and the things that I've been a part of and the times I've spoke somewhere. And we try to boast about those things almost as if this makes me a greater Christian than anybody else. And I try to remind people uh, anywhere I go and at, at Highland Park, and I know you do too, I'm sure at, at Riverside, I'm, I'm no greater of a Christian than anybody else is just because I'm the preacher, just because I'm uh, the minister. That title you know, we call a title is, it's just a description of what I do. I preach and I minister, I serve in some capacity. And in and of itself, the term minister indicates that I'm a servant. I'm not some great, you know, person that's over people. I'm simply another servant. And so he says, you wouldn't treat your servants in this, in the way that you'd say, hey, we really appreciate all that you've done for us. They're servants. That's what they were supposed to do. That was their duty. And he says, that's what your duty is as a Christian is serve people and don't brag about it. Don't boast about all the things that you do. It's not about your power, but about God's. Who does Jesus reserve his harshest words for? 
the the people who are the religious leaders. And I think that when we put when we put a higher significance on what you're saying, pulpit minister or a minister in general, we're setting ourselves up, not necessarily us, but the church is setting themselves up to be disappointed. You know, I mean, you're a servant, I'm a servant, we're slaves, we're bond servants, whatever you want to throw in that Paul called himself. That's really what we are. And so when we mess up and fall short, why should anybody be shocked by that? Now, they should feel empathy and, you know, as it, we're brothers and we mess up and fall short. But, I mean, I try to be where I'm not ever shocked when somebody goes, hey, I've got things that I struggle with. Well, yeah, you know, and, and there's nothing that is different about me. In fact, what does James say about teachers? You know, be careful. Harsher when judgment. You teacher. Yeah, harsher judgment. And, uh, you know, I think that we, I think that's kind of what Jesus is doing in Matthew is he's flipping that par- paradigm and going, you know, the greatest is the servant, not the guy out front. Yeah. And it's like the, the parable we talked about last time with the, pro- I think it was last time, the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got the son who's been there the whole time and then the one who comes at the end and you go, well, is he a son too? Yeah, you're both sons. It doesn't change who you are just because you work for 12 hours or for nine hours. You know, the problem with some people say, I oh, got to love me if I wait till the end. The problem is you don't know whether you're going to have that opportunity or not. You know, there's I think one person that controls that clock. <laughs> it's not me. So, you know, uh, we know how the parable works. Somebody could have that deathbed confession. Somebody could have an opportunity to do that, but we don't know that we're going to be granted those opportunities. And so being ready when the time comes uh, is, is a, is a huge thing that we've got to consider and know. And, sorry about that. I lost it for a second. Um, Hello. There? Yeah. We're there? Sorry. Right. So, um, you know, the other part about this is that, that I couldn't help but think of was Hebrews 11, you know, all these people of faith, And then when you get to the end of Hebrews 11 and you come to verses 39 and 40, there's some verses there that I don't even, I'm not sure I quite grasp exactly, you know, how they, how they work or what they mean, but it still makes me stop when he gets through talking about all these people who gave their life for the gospel, all these people who went through all these struggles, all these people who launched out in faith to leave their home like Abraham, you know, uh, Moses and and, and all these people. And then he says in verse 39 and all these, and this is after he talks about the ones who were killed for their faith. All these though commended through their faith did not receive what was promised. And you go, wait a minute. They didn't receive what was promised. What does that mean? Well, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. There's a sense in which, we're, and I don't know all of what that means, but the, the complete perfection of all things and bringing together of all things, I'm listed or I'm going to be among any of us who are believers, not me as a preacher, but us as Christians. So anybody watching who's following Christ, we're on the level with the people who gave their life for Christ. They may have been the, the laborers who worked the 12 hours and we may be the ones who comparatively speaking, whether it's the amount of time we lived and worked or whether it's the amount of work we got done, you know, um, versus what they did. We're still all a part of the ones who received that reward together. And that's where he talks about the cloud of witnesses, which we've been studying here in, in Hebrews 12, but it's that idea that all of those people will be made perfect and be made complete. And this whole story, this whole redemption story of mankind is going to be completed with all of us, not just with those people and not certainly just with me. That's a pretty cool thought to me. Awesome thought. (laughs) Yeah. So you guys have anything else to add to the, the story in Matthew 20? Travis, you got anything? I would say, you know, just as a challenge, as I like to kind of throw out there and, and continue the study, I almost touched my face there, almost. <laughs> um, you know, as Ben mentioned, and we've made reference to uh, Leviticus 19, go back and read that on your own and look at Deuteronomy 24. I think it's kind of interesting the things that we've been talking about, even over this whole thing on Zoom and 
internet Bible study, how many things that we've talked about in the parables of Jesus that Jesus kind of adds a little meat to the bone uh, to the law. And then think about the fact that Jesus is basically quoting himself because he's the word of God. So <laughs> there you go. Will? Uh, the only thing that kind of came to mind, Ben and I had the opportunity, I guess probably a month or two ago, uh, to go help uh, participate in a baptism of a lady from the nursing home. Um, and the lady was not, you know, not in incredible health, uh, was older. Uh, and so it was several of us that participated in that. And I can't wrap my mind around going, you know, she's older, her health issues could cause maybe her life to be cut short for me to just look at that and go, man, she doesn't deserve what I deserve because I've been a Christian for 12 years. You know, I, I just don't know how we get to that point, you know, and I think it all comes back to, you know, Jesus saying, you know, you love the Lord your God and you love your neighbor as yourself. And, and if I can, if I can hit those two things, then everything else will take care of itself. But, you know, what you said is, is very scary to me that the majority of the time Jesus has given these parables to the religious people, you know, to the ones where he's gone, Hey, I know your mindsets and you've got to change. Um, and so, you know, you take your challenge to look at the meat of it. And really, I think what we've said each time is these parables are a mirror for me to go, okay, how much do I love the people I'm around, whether they've got another day or two to live or whether they've got a hundred more years, you know, and seeing the true value in every person, no matter the stage, you know, of life that they're in. Well, and I, I was thinking about this, too, from the standpoint of the Jews, those who would have been listening, and even his apostles, they grew up Jewish, you know, and um, Jesus grew up Jewish, by the way. Um, and, and so, you know, they had the mindset of we are the people, you know, we're the ones who've been here all along. And, you know, later on in Acts chapter 1, 7 and 8, he's going to say, you're going to be my witnesses to those in Jerusalem, which we know is day of Pentecost, all the Jews. Uh, and then, you know, in the days following, then in all Judea, which is starting to branch out a little bit, uh, and into Samaria, and that was probably the hardest one for him to take, uh, one of the hardest ones, and then to the uttermost parts of the world, which is all of the Gentiles. And so, you know, if you really think about this passage, he's saying, hey, some of you guys have been here the whole time. Some of you guys are going to start, you know, learning about it as we go along, or people are going to start learning about it that haven't been a part of this. And the same thing is true for us today. There are people who, like us, um, like Travis and I know, and we'll, you know, raise, go into church all of our lives. And then there's those people who don't know as much about that. They weren't raised going to church, but they're just as much and can be just as much a part of the kingdom of God as us. They're going to have a little different mindset. They're going to have a different way of thinking about things. And, but that's important and that's good. And the first century church was made up of people from all walks of life. I can't even imagine what, I mean, you can get a little glimpse of it reading first and second Corinthians, but you know, just the glimpse of what those people were having to deal with, with all the different backgrounds that were in the church and God loves every one of them, not wishing second Peter chapter three, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if you're watching this and you were you know, raised in the church, we, we have to fight uh, the, the inclination or the thoughts of, that we're better than people uh, like the Pharisees did and everybody else that, um, you know, Hey, we were raised in this and we know exactly what we're doing. We have to fight that. And we probably need to repent of that thought if you've ever had it. Um, and then on the other side, we may have people watching it who are going, I don't know anything about this Bible thing. I don't know anything about God. Um, that's okay. He knows about you and he loves you and he wants you to know about him. And so it doesn't matter who you are, or where you are, God's got a place for you. And so we want you to know that uh, if you happen to be watching this. And, and we all started somewhere, right? I mean, right. today, there is no better time than now to, uh, to, to get on that. And we would love nothing more, whether at Highland Park, Riverside, whichever's closest, or if there's a church near you, you know, the, they would love nothing more than to, to help you in that process. Uh, the perfect law of liberty came that we would have freedom, not burden. So... Well, and uh, I just appreciate you guys joining in with us. We appreciate you guys uh, watching, and we hope that it's something beneficial to you and encouraging to you. And uh, we want you guys to, like Travis said, find a place to be, uh, find a place to, to discover God, 
And uh, if we can help you, then certainly contact us. Um, but, but find a way to plug in. These are the times uh, that we need to trust in God and, and uh, trust in one another to help each other. Will, got any closing thoughts? I'm good. If not, would you lead us in a prayer? I'll do it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love your son, and we're thankful for your spirit. We pray that uh, throughout everything that's going on in the world, the stresses of this virus, Father, that we can find peace in you. Uh, Father, we pray that as your people, that we can be your hands and your feet, that we can be your heartbeat, Father, that we can provide the peace uh, to the ones that are around us. Uh, Father, we ask that you will intervene in this situation, that you will help the doctors, the scientists, those that are researching it, that they can find a cure for it, Father. We know uh, that you have that capability, and we ask in faith, knowing that you can do it. Father, we pray that always we will trust uh, the plan that you have set, uh, that we will always trust you, that we will always lean on you for guidance every day. We pray for all of our healthcare professionals, that you would keep them safe, that you would give them strength. Father, that you would allow them to not uh, be affected by this virus, uh, but they can be uh, strengthened so that they can treat those that they're working with. Continue to love us. Uh, we pray for your forgiveness, for your grace, and for your mercy. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the patience that you give to us every single day. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. Hope you have a good evening.